Jesus. Jesus. Let me take you back for a moment to that place where Jesus was with his disciples. I believe they were on a boat out in the middle of the sea. Out in a place that's beyond their control. How do you know that when God really wants to get our attention, he puts us in a boat where we can't steer ourselves? And he begins to ask the disciples, who do men say that I am? Who do people say that I am? Well, we hear them say that you're Elijah. You're one of the prophets. You're one of any number of spectacular people of old that have died and passed away. And Jesus stops for a moment and he says, but who do you say I am? Who am I to you? As we enter into the Easter season, this is a question God has For each one of you, granted probably most of us have grown up in church, we've grown up around the things of God, we we are not new to any of this. And yet can I tell you that as we have lived for God for years and even decades, the question is still as relevant to you today as it was to those disciples in that boat who have walked with Jesus, they've been with him, they've heard him, they've touched him, they've eaten at his feet from the, the fish and the bread that he miraculously provided. They've seen all these great things. They've been astonished by all this stuff of, that God has done, and yet Jesus still asks them, who am I to you? Am I your grocery store? Am I your big brother? Am I your doctor? Am I your nurse? Am I your counselor? Or am I more? The challenge before us today, church, is who is Jesus Christ to us? I want to be like Peter. I want to be able to stand there and say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I want to be able to say it loud and understand that for Peter to say that was blasphemy according to the world, according to the established church. It was blasphemy for Peter to say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Why? Because we don't know that. I mean, there's a lot of things that God wants to do in our life that we, don't, we can't see from right here. We can't see the forest because of all the trees that are in front of us. And what did Jesus say? Blessed are you, Simon Peter, because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. How did Peter know? How did Peter know that Jesus was who he said he was? Just because he had an epiphany, a revelation? No, because he knew Jesus. He knew him. He knew his heart. And when he was ready, God opened up that heart and said, let me show you just a little bit more of who he is. And I believe at that moment, Peter was hearing angels sing. I believe at that moment, Peter was having what I call an aha moment. Wow, you really are the Son of God. That's why, that's why Peter had such a hard time when Jesus says, I've got to go to Jerusalem and I've got to die. I've got to die. No, you can't die. You're the Messiah. You're the king. You're the one that's going to kick all the Romans out into the ocean. You're the one that's going to restore power back to Israel and Israel will become a nation greater than that that David and Solomon had. That's why Peter had such a a hard time. Peter had such a hard time because that's my Savior. That's my Messiah. Look with me at Romans chapter 1.
Romans chapter 1. Paul begins by saying, I, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets and the holy scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. Jesus fulfilled all his requirements on two fronts. I am a son of David. Born in the right way, living in the right way. I am of this lineage. At the same time, the Holy Spirit has placed his stamp of approval upon Jesus saying, this is him. This is the one. This is the creator of all things, made flesh. And he is declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Think of one of the most unholy areas in our nation. Think of one of the most unholy areas in your mind, in your opinion, one of the most unholy places right here in America. This is who Paul is writing to. This is who he's speaking to. Rome in that day, Rome was the power of the world, and yet Rome was decadent. Rome was was chasing after lust and flesh. Rome was the epitome of everything that God stood against. With all of its gods, with all of its immorality, with all of its warmongering, with all of its placing man above deity, that we are lofty and ideal and we are wise and we are smart and we are beautiful. We are everything. And we have a whole bunch of gods over here. All of this culture that this letter is written to was to them. And the believers that are surrounded by all that stuff. What is Jesus asking them? He's saying, who am I to you? I have been born in the flesh of the right lineage, of the right stock, of the right pedigree. I've got the bloodline. Here it all is. And at the same time, I've got the mark of the Spirit upon me with the greatest mark there ever could be, the resurrection from the dead. Nobody else can claim that they popped out of the grave, except for a handful. The fascinating story of when Jesus was on the cross and he cried out and said, it is finished. And the veil ripped in two. The Bible says at that moment, holy men that were in their graves came up out of their graves and testified about this guy. Come on, tell me God doesn't mess with stuff. That had to mess with people. Uncle Robert, is that you? You died a year ago. (laughs) And you're back. And imagine these dead people. Come back to life. I mean, I'm telling you, this is crazy stuff. Come back to life, and what are they testifying about? They're testifying about a man that had just passed away, and now he comes to life. And they're testifying. Think about this. Think about this. Let me tell you who Jesus really is. How did they have an inside track? Because they were, they were on the other side of the heavenlies. They were over there hearing the testimony of who Jesus really is. And they get the privilege of coming back to testify. Guess what we heard? Guess what we saw? Guess what we experienced? This is who Jesus is. With all of that, all of that, and, and, and Paul would have been right there 
witnessing all this stuff, seeing all this stuff. There came a point in time where Paul, in doing all of his work for Jesus Christ, no, for God. Saul was doing all his work for God. And on that road to Damascus, he met the Lord. And that bright light shined, and I believe at that moment he was blinded to the point he couldn't, he was just so struck by the brilliance of the glory of God. And he said, Paul, why are you kicking against the goats? Why are you, why are you trying to do this wrong? And he said, who are you, Lord? He recognizes, I'm having an encounter. I'm having a spiritual encounter with God. And he says, who are you, Lord? It was at that moment, Paul, who was Saul, had to decide who this was. I've got to come to grips with who I'm serving. I've got to come to grips with that man. I've got to come to grips with who he is, what he is, and what he wants, and what he desires, and what he desires of me. And I believe that when Paul, with those scales, I'm kind of curious what that looks like, scales on his eyes. As he was taken to that house on Straight Street, and he had to sit there, Pastor Ed, what does the Bible say? He was there for a few days. Was it three days? He was there for three days. Blind. Not eating anything. I don't know that he was drinking anything. I mean, here's a brother who is on a fast. He is fasting with a purpose. What was he fasting about? Who is he to me? I believe he's struggling. He is working all of this out in his flesh, in his mind, in his heart. And the Holy Spirit is dealing with him and dealing with him and dealing with him. Because here's a man who's passionate after God. And yet he destroys the things that God's trying to do. Where God says, stop it. Stop it. Who am I to you? So when Paul is writing to the people in Rome. When he's writing in the middle to to the people who live amongst all this decadence and evil and lust and, and, and pagan religion and all this stuff that's around them. All the government of the world. The throne of the world right there in their midst. And he's speaking to them saying, wait a minute. Don't look at all this. Look in here. And who is the Lord to you? First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Wow. Can you imagine people knowing who you are because of the testimony of how you live for God? Mm. For God is my witness whom I serve. Verse nine, with my spirit In the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, if by some means now at at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you, for I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, or I believe as one translation says, I do not, would have, not have you to be ignorant, brethren, that I have often planned to come to you but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. I have seen everything, Paul says. I have seen it all. I've done it all. I'm indebted to the Greek who know everything. I'm I'm indebted to the barbarian, to the backwood redneck of our area. I'm indebted to them too because of what they know and this know and that know. And I know a lot and I know nothing. And what I've come to terms with is this. And I want to share it with you. 
That's what he says. I have been there, I've done that, I've seen it all, and let me tell you, it's kind of like Ecclesiastes. Go to Ecclesiastes and you'll see the same thing that the, the, the speaker who we know of as Solomon at the end of his days. I have been there, I've done that, I've seen it all, I've done it all. If you read a book of Ecclesiastes, it's very depressing. Because here's a man who knew from the beginning what he finally realizes at the very end, but he wasted all that time in the middle with all kinds of stupidity. I know what steak is like, and I know what the steak is like now at the end of my time. So if I knew what steak was, why did I mess around with all them Tootsie Rolls? Hey, it's almost lunchtime. This preaches. This preaches. Why did I mess around with stuff that did not matter? I've been there. I've done it. I knew it when I was young. And now that I'm old, I can say vanity, vanity. All is vanity. Why? Because you're chasing after stuff that does not matter. Paul says the same thing, only in a positive light. He says it a different way. I'm indebted to these and to these. I've been there. I've done that. I've learned. I've sought. And here is what I have found. And I want to share it with you. Verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God for what? Salvation. Come on, somebody say that word with me. Salvation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by what? The just shall live by what? The just shall live by what? Faith. I've seen it all. I've done it all. And I stood before my God and even heard my God Face to face, voice to voice. And let me tell you what I've learned. Let me tell you what I've found. I have found that through the faith in the Son of God, there is life. There is life for you. There is life for me. There's a whole other life that's yet to be lived. But we only find it in Jesus Christ, not in anything else. For I am learned, and I have sought, and I have done, and I have lived for God, and I have persecuted the church, and I've done everything. I've been here and done that, and yet I'm here to tell you what I have learned. I've had to learn in faith that my God loves me, and he loves you, not for what I do, but for who I believe in, and I place my trust in. Who is he to you? Now, come on, as a pastor, I have to wrestle with this same question. I have to wrestle with this same thought. Just who is God to me? Is he God enough to heal the body? Is he God enough to heal the mind and the heart? Is he God enough that he can establish? Is he God enough that he could tear down and rebuild? Is he God enough that he could restore? Is he God enough that he could make us fly? Is he God enough that he could take us to places we could only imagine? That he could open the door that no man could shut and yet shut doors that no man could open? Is my God the kind of God that could place me from the lion's den up into the king's palace? Can he put me in the belly of the whale down in the bottom of the ocean and then make me an international evangelist amongst my enemies? Could God do such a thing? And let me tell you, yes, he can. Why? Because I know who my God is. I know who my God is. And I'm learning who my God is. Because I got a feeling just to be very transparent with you. I've got a feeling that at the end of our days and we live to be the ripe old age of a hundred and whatever, well, some of you will because I don't plan to. You can have it. We live to be 120 years old. We're still just getting to know who he is. The thing about eternity that thrills my heart it's not because we're going to be like little naked cherubs with little bitty wings and our little bitty harps and we're going to be sitting on some cloud and playing. All, that doesn't sound like heaven to me. It sounds cold. 
I've seen my baby pictures. I don't want to go back to that. (laughs) And playing a harp. Come on, man. There's got to be something better I can play. And a harp. That just don't sound manly. (laughs) I think that what eternity is going to be is taking all of that time just to be able to answer that question to its fullest degree. Who am I to you? Yet here in this life, we've got to ask, we've got to answer that question here. We've got to be able to know who our God is. As we go into the Easter season, this is your challenge. Who is God to me? Is he the God that has failed you? Is he the God that has failed you in your marriage? He's failed you with your children. He's failed you in your health. He's failed you in your finances. He's failed you in every other area of your life. Is he the God that has let you down? Who has broke your heart? Who has discouraged you? Who didn't do things the way that you felt like they ought to be done? Is he the God that has hurt you and been malicious and been cruel? And God, how could you do that? And how could you let evil exist? And how could you just let me down the way that you did? Is he the God of forgetfulness that he doesn't even know who, where you are? That you begin to thank God I am forgotten? That you don't even know where I'm at? that enough people in this world don't know where Poe in Arkansas is? What about you, Lord? Have you forgotten that you made this place? Or is he the God that has never left you? He has never forsaken you. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And he says, you will seek me and find me When you search for me with what? Jeremiah 29, verse 13, I think it is. When you search for me with all of your heart. Not a portion of it, not a bit of it, not just a little part that's comfortable with it, but when you begin to get down to the nitty gritty and the scales are on your eyes and you're fasting and you're weeping and you're hurting because you fell off your horse in the middle of the road and you're embarrassed because you're having to be waited on hand and foot because you can't get around because God has brought you to a place of nothingness where you have to come down in the dirt and be able to say, I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. At one time I thought I did. At one point I thought I knew what was going on. But I'm at a place, God, I don't know who you are. Somebody hear me today. And then God is going to smile. And he's going to say, I've been waiting for you. To come to this place. Because sometimes we have to unlearn the things we have learned. Sometimes the scales that are on our eyes are not the things God has done. But what we have done to ourselves. That I am Saul. And I've made a mess of things God. And the scales that are on my eyes where I cannot see you and understand who you are. Is not your fault. It's my fault. And we begin to break. And we begin to weep. Have you know that's okay. Brokenness. Listen. Brokenness is a beautiful thing to God. Because when we are broken like the woman that broke the alabaster jar, we come with all of our guilt. We come with all of our dirtiness. We come with our bad reputations. And Jesus Loves us the more for it. This woman has not stopped washing my feet with her tears. She's not stopped drying it with her hair. And what have you done for me? When we come to that place where we say, maybe I don't know you like I think I do, God. That's when revelation begins to happen. That's when the power of God 
begins to move afresh and new in your life. Because you may be in a place right now where you say, Pastor Mike, I don't feel anything. I don't feel the Spirit moving. Can I tell you that just because you don't feel it doesn't mean somebody else can't. When there's messages and tongues and interpretation, when there's people responding to the altars, that doesn't mean that God's not moving here. It may mean God's not moving here. How do you know the last one that knew Saul was unsaved was Saul? Because there was plenty who saw this holy, righteous man. But Saul had no idea he wasn't saved until the Lord showed up and says, Saul, why are you kicking against what I'm trying to do? Mmm. Mmm. Do you know what's so special about coming to grips with this issue? At Easter time. Let's close with this. When we come to the terms that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is as strong and as powerful as He says He is, just a few down, days down the road is a thing we know of as the day of Pentecost. Because the Pentecostal power was poured out by the Holy Spirit. Have you know we believe in the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the gifts and the moving of the Holy Spirit. It was poured out on those who on that day, Peter stood. Peter, who was a redeemed failure, he stood and he began to preach. This is who Jesus is. Who is he to you? And all of these people began breaking under this question, saying, oh my Lord, what are we going to do? How are we going to reconcile this? Believe upon Jesus Christ, repent, and be saved. And what happened? The Holy Spirit began to move. I want you to bow your heads with me right now. Typically at a spot like this, I'd want to give an altar call. That if anybody doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, this would be the moment to accept him. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something different here today. Just feeling led of the Lord to do this. There's not a single person in this room who is saved by themselves. We are at best a sinful people who are clinging to God to be redeemed and are being, are being redeemed. And yet we still sin. I'm not saying you're not saved. But I am saying you're not perfect. And we fall short. Jesus Christ is asking you right now with your head bowed, your eyes closed. Jesus Christ is asking you, who am I to you? There's nobody here to impress. There is no answer here that's going to make somebody think how theologically astute you are. There's nothing here for you to say except an acknowledgement between yourself and Jesus Christ. What needs to be said is you are my Savior and my Lord. Now hear this. With your head bowed, I want you to, th you need to consider this. That when I call Jesus Christ my Lord, then everything that goes with it comes into my life. Not just the blessings, not just the peace, not just the hope 
and the joy of a heaven to gain, and I get to miss hell. But what comes with saying, you are the son of the living God. You are the savior. You are that power of salvation that is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. When we admit that this is who he is, then we also must accept the lifestyle we must live, which is a life that is bent towards holiness to God and not selfishness of the flesh of what I want to do. I'm going to ask you right now with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, nobody looking around. I ask you today, who is he to you? If you would say that he is already your savior, then I ask, how have you been living? Holy Spirit, do not let anybody ignore this right now. If you would say that you are right with God, then you must ask this question. Answer this question, how have I been living? Am I living like Jesus truly is the Savior? Am I living like he really is a judge of sin? Or am I living how I want? By having my Jesus in one hand and the world in the other. I'll tell you today, friend, Jesus loves you so much that he was willing to give up everything for you. God's not asking you to throw your money away, burn your house down, dress down in rags, and live in a cardboard box, and eat dirt and leaves the rest of your life. It's not what he's asking. He's simply saying, who really am I to you? Because there was another generation that was there while Jesus was alive who had ears, but they could not hear. They had eyes, but they would not see. They had minds, but they refused to comprehend because Jesus did not fit in to their box and their categories. It wasn't going the way they wanted. Hear me, church. They missed him. But to those like Paul who struggled with the scales on their eyes and said, my God, I am nothing. My education is nothing. He would go on in a letter later in life and he would say, I count it all as loss to have apprehended this one thing, that Jesus Christ is the Lord and that I am saved through him. I do not want to be the generation that cries out, give me Barabbas and crucify the one that I no longer believe in. Because I believe there were those in that day who said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and waved a palm branch that one week later was yelling, crucify him, crucify him. I don't want to be that person. How about you? But I want to be able to answer that question. You are the son of the living God. And you are my Lord. Are you willing to, are you willing to claim that today?
Are you, are you willing to receive that today? Are you willing to make it your oath in your life? With every head bowed, every eye closed, here's what we need to do today. I want you to pray with me. You're not going to lose any spiritual ground. If anything, you're going to gain it by reaffirming what we should already know. Pray with me, Lord Jesus. Come on, pray with me, Lord Jesus. I declare today that I need you. I am nothing apart from you. Come into my life. Come into my heart and save me. Make me yours all over again. Help me to answer the question of who are you to me. I need to know that you are my God. I need to know that you'll always be there for me. I need to know that you are more powerful than anything I'll face. Today, I make you my God. I call you my Savior. And I trust my life to you. In Jesus' name. Father God, I pray right now that for every single one that's here today, those that are watching my video, that Lord God, each one of us is answering this question. And Father, I pray if there's anybody that did not pray that prayer or anybody that doesn't understand what they are saying, that Father, I pray right now through the power of the Holy Spirit, reveal to them, Lord God, reveal to them, just as you did to Peter, reveal to them on their own boat, in their own lake, reveal to them, Lord God, in that place that you are the Son of the living God, that you will never leave them nor forsake them, that no matter what they go through, you're still God and you're still powerful and you're still holy. You're still righteous. You're still in love with us. You still hold us in the palm of your hand. That the devil's not bigger. You are not smaller. But you're still God. Remind us of this, God. So that, Father, we may be able to do what the Bible says. We may be able to answer To give an answer when somebody asks for the reason of the hope we have in our life. Because my life is based upon Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. He is my God. And I know Him. And I am known by Him. That if anybody asks God who I am, He'll be able to answer, He's mine. She's mine. Father, hold us in your hands. And lead us, Lord God, into deeper and greater places of your presence. As we leave here today, give us a wonderful day. A great lunch. But Father, help us to remember that if we call you our God, then we must obey the things that you tell us. Help us, Lord, to live it out, to walk it out, to read, to pray, to attend, to give, to do all the things we're supposed to be doing. So that when you come back, you won't find us busy. You'll find us faithful. Lord, I love you. I thank you for this good day. In Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. I encourage you with this thought. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today and you asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, would you come see me? Come talk to me. I want to rejoice with you because you have made the best decision of your life. Maybe you've been away from God and you prayed that and renewed that relationship. Come see me. 
I'd like to celebrate with you. There's some things you need to be doing. If you have a home church, I ask you to be faithful to it. If you don't have a church, come to this one. Come to anyone, but I like this one. But here's why. You need the body of Jesus Christ. You need to be among other believers. You need to be attending church. You need to be reading your Bible. You need to be spending time with God, just coming into his presence and talking to him like he's your best friend. God understands something other than King James English. He actually understands redneck. Talk with God. Be with him. And find that deeper relationship. So that it's not one time I knew God. I know him now and am being known by him. Stand with me if you would. I love you. But more than that, God loves you. And who knows, there may be somebody next to you that loves you. Turn to somebody, shake their hand, hug their neck. Tell them you're glad you got to see them today. Y'all have a wonderful afternoon. Don't forget to be back with us and join us at uh, 5 o'clock for service tonight. God bless you. If you're having spring break, have a wonderful spring break. But get back to church as soon as possible. God bless y'all.